it was the Kodak Digital Prototype. Looking like this, it was the early stages of a CCD, which is a type of a sensor. It captured only 100 by 100 pixels, not very much resolution at all, just enough for maybe like your thumbnail if you were to print it, not very big. And this early stage of the Kodak camera was in black and white. Next, let's look at the Fuji camera of 1988. It was the Fuji Fijex DS-1P. It was first premiered at the Fotokina trade show. It was all the rave of the digital cameras ready to take over the film world. It was really the first true digital camera that was much different than its prototype from Kodak over a decade earlier. It had a 400,000 pixel sensor. That's less than half a megapixel, if you're counting, if you're doing the math. It had a removable SRAM memory, so you could take it out and you put it into your hard drive. But remember, computers in the late 80s weren't very big on hard drive as well. Next, we have the 1990 Dicam model, number one. It looked kind of like a cell phone. It was also known by the name Logitech Photoman. Sounds very, very precise. Now, people called it entrepreneurs, marketers, those who try to make you buy it by saying nice fancy things and fluffy about you, as the brownie camera of the digital era. The brownie camera, the camera in the hands of the masses that everybody would have that looked something like this from the film world. Now everybody would have their own. Personally, I never heard of it, I did my research. It recorded a 376 pixel by a 240 pixel camera in black and white only. The people that really liked this little cell phone type looking camera it wasn't a cell phone, it only did pictures. Were realtors, insurance adjusters who could take a picture and they could document something happened very quickly. So the realtors and the insurance adjusters liked it to verify claims. But that's about it. It just didn't take off because, well, it's kind of a small picture. Really, really small. Next, in 1981, came Kodak, the DCS. Now Kodak actually wasn't even a camera at this point, it was like their fancy camera of the film world that you would add on an additional back. You had a digital backpack, kind of like the cell phones, you had the big backpacks, and you were cool walking down the street with your big cell phone. It was very, very different, kind of like that. It was invented by Bruce Bayer. It was really the first commercial digital SLR because it used the film camera, literally the same camera, with a digital recording mechanism. It had a 1.3 megapixel CCD. Ooh, it's getting bigger, over twice what the other ones were doing at that time. And it had a separate recording device, your backpack. 1992, along came the Leaf digital camera back. Now you can take your medium format or your large format cameras that were very high end, like Mamiya's and other cameras, and you could take a camera as a very good picture in a digital form. It would scan the pictures and it would do it in three stages. One for the red channel, one for the green channel, and one for the blue channel. Each channel was individual. And on top of this, the CCD had a 4 megapixel quality. Ooh, much bigger as you would expect from a medium format, high quality film camera. In 1993, out came the Fuji DS200F. Now this was a fancy looking camera. It looked kind of like a Polaroid camera, a little pop-up flash. Very different looking for sure. But it was a tad of its times. It was the first solid state memory. It didn't have removable memory. It was actually a solid state, a different kind of memory, which very, very pioneering for the day. It recorded 640 pixels by 480 pixels. Not very big, pretty small. But it was progress and we like progress. We really, really do. And now in 1994, the Apple Quick Take 100. The Quick Take 100 kind of looked like an alarm clock. Something to do smash with a hammer because it wakes you up in the morning. But it did take pictures. It was the first consumer camera under a thousand dollars. And that's a good thing to have a camera that's cheaper. Apple was always pioneering and breaking into the market and trying new things. And that's a good thing. This was Apple's first camera. Now, we always know of Apple with the iPhone, which has very good cameras. 1994, the Kodak AP, Associated Press, NC2000 came out. This was especially designed for the Associated Press photographers who needed pictures right now. When they take a picture, they need to be in the newspaper in just a few hours, ready to print and to show up in your morning. See, newspapers, they are like a piece of paper that you get early in the morning. People get up way early to deliver it on your doorstep. 
It's fun. People used to get the news a long time ago before the internet and the digital iPads and all those devices. It was a 1.3 megapixel size, had up to 1600 ISO, so that's a good thing, especially in the film world of that time. Though it was a little bit expensive. It was $17,950. But wait, if you were an Associated Press member, you got the discount. You got it for a thousand less dollars. How very generous of them, because you were Associated Press. The Vancouver Sun was the first newspaper to change over to completely digital. Now, the digital era was first received best by newspaper photographers because of the timeliness and not having to worry about developing film and getting it all ready for papers early we in the hours when most of you should be sleeping. Still though, in 1994, there was the Olympus Deltas VC 1100. Ooh. What was so special about this camera, you say? It was the first one to transport an image over a telephone line. Kind of like we had those little modems. No, 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 don't pick up the phone, don't pick up the phone. Hello? Ah, you ruined my internet connection. That's the kind of connection we had. Very old school. But it's transferred an image through electronic lines of your phone line. Very cool. Now into 1995, we had the Casio GV10. The Casio GV10 was the first preview in the back of your camera that actually had LCD screen. Because this is a digital camera from Kodak. It doesn't have an LCD screen. Before that, if they did have an LCD screen, it was more for menus and you see a little bit of information in your camera, but it actually didn't show you a preview of what your camera shot. Nowadays, we take pictures on our phones, we take pictures on the cameras, and we expect to see the camera image on the back. It wasn't always an option. But there's more. In 1995, Ricoh created the RDC-1. It had a, a pop-out LCD screen. You could actually pop it out and rotate it. Very high technology. It also was the first camera to have a photo and a video option in the same camera. It was to have five seconds of video at one time in the new MPEG format with sound. Ooh, very nice. And it played back on the back of your 2.5 inch LCD screen on the back of the camera. Or you could plug it into your TV and watch the beautiful colors on your television. Let's go ahead to 1997. We got the Sony Mavica. This is the MCV FD5 or the FD7. Now they were taking the country by storm because they were cheap. They're only about $800. And they actually had a 10 inch zoom. You could actually zoom in with the lens. And it was an optical zoom, better than these digital zooms of the day. You could zoom in on your camera, get a nice close up of your camera, but it wasn't big and heavy. It didn't have the big digital SLR lens. And it was being processed by serious photographers. I actually recommended this to my aunt who was taking pictures for her missionary slides and she wanted to get rid of the film camera. It was too bulky, too expensive, too clunky. And I recommended after lots of research to get this camera for only a steal of $800. What a deal. This would actually record to a floppy drive. I can't get it out at the moment, but a three and a half an inch floppy drive into the back of your camera. And you can take that floppy drive and put it right into your computer and get beautiful pictures in no time flat. Now these Sony Mavicas actually had 40% of the US market. 40% of the people that own cameras in the digital economy had the Sony Mavica. It's a staple. That means millions of people use this and they use the floppy drive to go with it. Groundbreaking technology. Thank you, Sony. In 1998, the Olympias Comedia D500L, very fancy name, had a zoom lens reflex. You could zoom in with the lens and you get a fixed a fixed lens, the lens didn't come on and off, but you could get some good zoom lens and some good zoom quality compared to some of the smaller lenses, even like the, the Sony Mavica. The resolution was only 1024 by 768 resolution, but it was pretty good. And it was affordable at only $899. Very nice. Very nice job. In 1999, more technology was evolving. We had the Kiro Sierra VP210. The Kiro Sierra VP210 was actually only in Japan. It never came to the United States. It just didn't make it over disease. It probably sunk on the boat because it was just too heavy. Now this little phone, this little device could have 20 still pictures stored on it. And it could have two frames per second of a video transfer call. So you could have the video phone call and chat with people, kind of like the Jetsons with two pictures every second updated. It just didn't catch on. It was too glitchy. Also in 1999, we have the Nikon D1. This is a true digital camera without all the backs, without all the devices, not kind of following a film, but having a revolutionary camera. Revolution! 
It was the first digital SLR body designed completely from scratch. It had a 2.7 megapixel camera. Compared to cameras of the day, it was only half the price at $4,999 in 1999. Isn't that nice? It was for serious photojournalism. Those who wanted to take their cameras and take news photography and have it on the paper the next day. The Nikon D1 also helped to end the reign of Kodak. It wasn't as prestigious anymore and Nikon really started to knock the socks off Kodak in its digital era. Next in 2002, we have the Context and Digital, the Context brand. Yeah, I've never heard of it really much before either. But before this, it kind of didn't make much. Well, it was the first full frame digital SLR in 2002. And there's a reason you haven't heard of the company. It had lots of problems, lots of mistakes. It just didn't work very well. It did have five megapixel. It wasn't a 5D, it had five megapixel. Captured good quality, sort of. But it had a lot of performance flaws and it just couldn't hold up to its professional counterparts by Kodak and Canon and other companies. So it fizzled, and we never heard from them again. Ah, then in 2003, we had the Canon Rebel. Now, Andre Agassi in the 10S had the Canon in the 1990s with the film camera, and he had his swooshing hair, and his tennis racket, and he had the Rebel, because he was a Rebel. But now they had the Digital Rebel, so not just a regular Rebel, an Ultra Digital Rebel is more precise. It was the first digital SLR, single lens reflex, under $1,000 for the consumer. People could now afford it. Digital cameras and the masses of people could touch it. It recorded six megapixels, which was the first camera I started in 2003 when I was going to school for photography. Serious amateur photographers that liked film were now starting to switch over. The digital revolution was starting to run away and people had switched over to the digital rebel and other similar cameras. GoPro, you might have heard of it, kind of like the name Kleenex now. The GoPro, the itty bitty little video cameras, was taking over the planet. People can now have video cameras anywhere. They can take them on the go, they are very cool, lots of angles, where cameras couldn't normally go. They were rugged, they had waterproof containers, and they could do a lot of things that other cameras couldn't. Ah, then in 2007, Apple released its iPhone number one. They didn't call it iPhone one because it was the first one. Now we have many other versions iPhone with the ability to take pictures and video on your phone. Pictures have been done on some cameras before, but now the ability to have videos in your pocket or in your purse at any time was groundbreaking, revolutionary. A total of 6.1 million iPhone originals were created and sold. Everybody had to have an iPhone because it was the latest and greatest craze. In 2008, Panasonic Lumex G1 came out with the first Micro Four Thirds, the first mirrorless camera that did not have the mirror in front of the cameras like the digital SLRs. No, no, it did not have that. It made it quieter and it made it more durable. And it also started to improve some of the qualities, which now become the mirrorless line, which Canon and Nikon and Sony and Olympus, they all have the mirrorless camera. The biggest change is that they actually made it so the lens was closer to the back of the camera. This was going to revolutionize the ways for crisper, sharper pictures, smaller, lighter lenses, and cheaper lenses with higher quality, which led to a big revolutionary thing in the quality world. Quality of cameras was a big deal because of this one change that the Micro Four Third mirrorless had brought to the world. Also in 2008, we had the Canon 5D Mark II. Now we had the 5D Mark I for several years already, but the Mark II was able to shoot video and photos at the same time. HD video was now in the hands of the consumer. You could do very good work at a consumer price, and get a good grade, and even use in Hollywood films with a 5D video camera. It could do both. It could do pictures and it could do video. How nice. Flashing forward a few years. Yes, flashing, that's a good fun. Flashing ahead. <laughs> 2012, flashing ahead to the Sony Cybershot RX number one. The Sony Cybershot RX one, I don't have a copy, but it was a consumer, a compact camera that now had a full frame camera. This is a Nikon wannabe, but it had a full frame sensor on a smaller compacted. So you could take it easier on a hike or on a journey or if you didn't have any big muscles, you could carry this camera much easier than some of the bigger, beefier cameras that we had. So the Sony CyberX RX1 changed the world with little camera with a big quality full frame sensor. 
And then in 2011 to about 2014, there was the Elytro camera. The Elytro camera did a lot of th things. It came up looking like little lipstick containers at first, little novelty toy cameras. But the ability with some of these bigger cameras, and I've used them before, it had a fixed lens, a very long lens, like 28 millimeters or like 250 millimeters or something like that. And you could zoom in and zoom out a long ways, all with a fixed lens, and lenses didn't come on and off. But it also, the big thing with Elytro cameras is you could choose the focusing after the fact. You could look at the back of your camera and you could choose I want this focus or that focus and you could point at that piece. After a few years, Lytro was discontinued and that technology was put into things like cell phones. Now cell phones have the ability to focus after the fact. Live photos and the ability to take pictures and to focus after the fact has become very standard in the small pocket digital cell phone world. So these 23 cameras at digital have changed the world. What ones changed you? What ones did you own? I have my original one from college, the Canon 20D. Maybe you have another camera that you used. Write it down in the comments. Let's have a discussion. What cameras did you use that changed the world of photography for you? As always, thank you for watching Genius Photography. We'll see you next time.